from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out to Noir at the National Book Festival, and thanks to the Library of Congress for having us. And we owe a special debt to Colleen Shogan and Nicholas Brown for arranging this event and putting Noir at the Bar in the national spotlight. <coughs> For those of you who've never been to a Noir at the Bar, it's an event that was started about a decade ago by the crime fiction book blogger Pete Rosatsky in Philadelphia. Basically, a group of crime fiction writers get together in a bar, drink, and read short stories or excerpts of novels. Given the bar setting, the alcohol, and the fact that crime fiction writers tend to enjoy hanging out in the outskirts of respected literary society, these readings are usually raunchy and full of vulgarity but generally stay true to noir or neo-noir tradition. See, you, you learned something. That's it though, that's all you'll learn tonight. Given that this is a family event and we'd like to come back next year, we're gonna cut down on the raunch and the swearing, but we'll still have a fair amount of sketchiness and shady characters, which leads us right to our first reader, Louis Bayard. <laughs> there he is. Lou's eight novels include The Edgar Nominated, The Pale Blue Eye, The New York Times Notable Mr. Timothy, and The Recent Lucky Strikes, named one of the best young adult titles of 2016. His other novels include The Black Tower, The School of Night, and Roosevelt's Beast. His essays and articles have appeared in the Los Angeles and New York Times, The Washington Post, Salon, and Book Forum. He was also the author of the Downton Abbey recaps for The New York Times, which embarrassingly, he mistakenly called Downtown Downtown Abbey, well until the show's second season. Here's Lou. I knew Ed would spread lies about me. I knew that it was just one of those things that you knew was going to happen. Well, welcome everybody. It's great to be here. Thank you, Ed, for organizing us all and getting us here. Um, yeah. I think it's hilarious we're in the children's space right now, and I've been, I'm already f busily, furiously editing what I have to read tonight. Um, just a brief introduction. A few years back, a friend and I were leafing through the DC noir anthology in which Jim Grady was prominently featured. I, at, least, at least Jim Grady, maybe who knows. And we realized suddenly that there were no gay writers in it, at least no writers that we'd ever dated before between us. Um, and led to the, that led to this whole conversation about gay noir and whether such a thing was even possible. I, of course, contended that it was. And to prove it, I wrote this story, which was eventually published in the City Paper's annual fiction issue. And in fact, this story is set in DC in the late 80s, and it's titled Chesapeake, not after the bay, I should add, but the bar, the Chesapeake House, which was a really <laughs> sleazy uh, gay strip club that used to draw a crowd back in the day, not very far from here, in fact, very close by. So this is how the story begins. And this will, be, uh, this will be PG. A quarter century ago, or maybe it was a million years, I dated a full-lipped, morally unanchored charmer named Benjamin, who was in his third year of Georgetown Law. Better to say I tried to date him. One night, because he wouldn't cut me loose, and because I couldn't cut myself loose, and because abjection came as naturally to me then as breathing, I followed him without his knowledge from Badlands down Peace Street. He crossed DuPont Circle, cut up New Hampshire, then a little shy of U Street, he paused in front of a cinnamon brick apartment building. Like a mariner back from the Spice Islands, he gazed up at a second floor window where a lamp was even now extending a tongue of light. He nodded to himself, then made straight for the vestibule where he waited for the answering buzz. In less than a minute, his shadow, unmistakable with its lacrosse shoulders, flickered across the apartment's curtains. This much I knew, he would eat before he did anything else. 20 minutes later, an order from Trio Pizza arrived. I slipped in after the delivery guy, followed him to the second floor, watched a door spring open, saw a pair of hands, not Benjamin's. Apartment 203. The blaze of revelation subsided as I planted myself opposite the door. If I were to have the confrontation I wanted, needed, feared, I'd have to sit there for the rest of the evening, my back against the wall. 
Instead, I fell asleep and woke an uncertain number of hours later. A slender young man was standing in the open doorway of apartment 203 in a pair of oversized sweatpants. I lurched to my feet. Sorry, I'm Knox. Like the fort. Yeah. Benjamin's gone, sweetie. The voice was soft and low, but with Carolina vowels. I, I doubt he even saw you there. He was in a hurry to get to class. Even in my sleep-dazzled state, I could discern two things. The young man was lying, and this lying was a form of charity. I'm Joey, he said. You should come in. He made a pot of Irish breakfast and poured it in, out in beer mugs. He fed me Danish and Jiffy Pop. He loaned me a comb. The clock radio on his kitchen counter had ticked just past 11 a.m. when he leaned across his biscuit crate coffee table and folded his soft, white fingers around my long, thin, veined ones. You know, he's not worth this, he said. It occurred to me to deny it, but in the next breath, Joey said, I think I'm done with him, too. Decades later, I'm still unpacking the grace of that moment. One man able, in just a few words, to free two men to take them both out of the hunt. Do you have a place to stay tonight, he asked. The answer was no. I had just been evicted from my apartment in Mount Pleasant. My belongings were somewhere in the attic over city lights, and I was waiting to hear about a studio in Shaw. I was 23. I'd come to Washington not for a career, but for a boy, and I was dying. But we all were. The couch pulls out, said Joey. I lay on that couch for about a week. Joey cleaned around me. He was a terror about dust. And when he got tired of that, he draped the Thursday classifieds over me. Just in case, he said. I wasn't very employable then. Two years of a crunchy liberal arts college in central Pennsylvania, segments of office slavery, a moderate acquaintanceship with word star and multi-mate. The old people here will know those things. Um, but I beefed up my resume as much as I dared and flooded every office in town. No one called back. For cash, I took gigs bussing tables at the American Cafe, answering phones at an optometric association, modeling in the deep background of a Sheraton print ad. Sometimes, in a brief flush of solvency, I would offer to write Joey a check for the rent, but he waved his hand at me. When the ship comes in, Never once did I see him write a check of his own, nor could I begin to say whose name was on the lease or who was paying for our groceries. The bowls of citrus fruit on the kitchen counter, the whole chickens in the freezer, the packages of tuna helper in the cu cupboard, they were just there, waiting. Most days, Joey slept until one or two in the afternoon, and it wasn't until eight or nine in the evening that he would put on his denim shorts and his two polo shirts and go off to see his friend. Friend being, in this case, a category rather than an individual. The one job I knew him to hold down was as a dancer at the Chesapeake House, and only because he invited me on impulse to watch him perform. Of the three guys dancing on the runway that night, he was the oldest, which is to say he was 23, but the most boyish in appearance. He wore a jockstrap gray athletic socks and uh, white tree torns and he moved in a benign fog as though we were all part of his dream. I hustled him out of the place, I hustled out of the place before midnight. Joey told me later I'd missed the Scottish Fantasia. That's oblique enough, right? That's oblique enough. <laughs> Our schedules were ideally matched. If I wanted to bring a trick home from... <laughs> uh, if I wanted to bring a gentleman home from tracks or the frat house, Joey would already be gone. And by the time the gentleman was leaving the next morning, Joey was just coming back laden with rolls and oranges. Have a blessed day, he'd call out. Our only moment of intersection came late in the afternoon when like an old married couple, we would sit on the chapped leather couch and watch the squawk box. Neither Joey nor I had any sure idea of what was going on in the world, but we both found the news mysteriously restful, like listening to traffic reports for highways you would never travel. So it was that one afternoon in June, our eyes came to rest on a perfectly unremarkable press conference, three legislators before a thicket of microphones. The third man was halfway through his remarks when Joey said, oh, that's ear flaps. 
well. Ear Flaps, in addition to being a Kansas Republican, is a sometime patron of the Chesapeake House. Uh, so from here, the tale becomes increasingly twisted. It includes blackmail, an unexpected death, and rueful life lessons. And you can Google the rest of it uh, on the internet at your leisure. Or maybe cross your fingers. Look for it in the next DC Noir um, anthology. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lou, I guess. <laughs> Kathleen Barber's debut novel is Are You Sleeping? A suspense novel out now from Simon & Schuster. It's received praise from Book Reporter, Pop Sugar, and yes, the Oprah.com. She attended the University of Illinois and Northwestern University School of Law and now lives in Washington, DC. When she's not writing, Kathleen enjoys traveling the world with her husband, <clears throat> and spending lots and 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 lots of time on Twitter. Here's Kathleen Barber. Thanks, Ed. Um, I do probably spend way too much time on Twitter, so um, if you're looking for someone to follow, that, that's me. Um, thanks so much for having me. I've, this is also a confession. I, I have never been to Noir at the Bar, so this is my, my first chance. So if I do it wrong, don't blame Ed, blame me. Bye. Okay. In retrospect, I should have listened to our friends who scoffed when we solicited recommendations for a cat sitter. The cat will be fine, they said. You're going away for a long weekend, not a month. Just leave some food and water and the cat will take care of himself. But George Harrison, the cat, not the beetle, was our baby and he had this bad habit of wedging himself into spaces from which he could not escape, like between the refrigerator and the wall. And I had horrible visions of him slowly starving to death while James and I drank wine with an ocean view. So we found a cat sitter online. Her name was Megan, and she had hair the color of cotton candy. I didn't like the way that she looked at James, the way her mascara and lashes drooped, and her teeth caught her glossy lips. But James said it was all in my head. Besides, George Harrison seemed to like her, curling around her tattooed ankles almost immediately, and that was all that mattered. Our trip went a bit sideways when someone stole my purse, which had my driver's license inside, which meant I no longer had the identification necessary to board an airplane. It could have been a complete disaster, but Megan happily went to our place, followed our directions to unlock a specific desk drawer, and found my passport, which she then overnighted to the hotel. So we gave her a bonus and promised to recommend her to others, and then we forgot about her. Months later, I came home and found the cat's dishes in the middle of the living room floor. I looked to George Harrison for explanation, but he merely licked a paw and stalked out of the room. I shrugged and returned the dishes to the kitchen where they belonged. The next day, I came home to find the dishes moved again. When I questioned James, he looked at me like I was crazy. I haven't been doing that. Do we have a poltergeist? I wondered. Maybe you're just not getting enough sleep, hon. I might have accepted his explanation if things hadn't started happening. I found the silverware piled on the table, the books rearranged, spines facing in, a wine glass we hadn't used drying on a kitchen towel. James accused me of doing all this to screw with him, and I wondered if I was cracking up. But then some money went missing. Not much, but enough that we noticed. And I realized somebody must be coming to the house. But who? There were no signs of a break-in, and James's mother was the only one with a set of keys. I doubted she was leaving her retirement community to prank us. And then we remembered Megan. It was so obvious. She must have made a copy of our house keys. We know what you're doing, James told her over the phone, and you need to stop. I don't know what you're talking about, she said coolly and hung up on us. But the call put a stop to things, or we thought it did. One week later, James called me into the study. 
He gestured to an open desk drawer and asked, his voice tight, have you moved anything? I knew that drawer. I knew what he was asking me. That was the drawer where James kept the pot he sold. And I could see from where I was standing that it was strangely empty except for a scale. It wasn't like James was some sort of drug dealer. He was, he was a hobbyist, just procuring some stuff from his younger cousin, this skinny skateboard punk who actually was a drug dealer, and then, you know, distributing it to some friends, all of whom were happy to reimburse James for his cost and maybe also throw in a little extra for his time and effort. Hardly Walter White. But still, I kept my hands as far away from that as possible, and I sure hadn't moved anything. Megan, I said, who else could it have been? Because, of course, there was no other answer. We had told Megan where we kept the keys to that desk, had basically handed her unfettered access to her records and our secrets. How had we been so stupid to think she would be put off by one half-baked phone call? Do you think she's been taking small amounts for weeks now? I asked. Distracting us from her theft with things like moving the cat stitches? And do you think she took everything in retribution for that call? I don't know, James growled, but we have to get it back. I'm going over there. I ran to put on shoes and met James by the car. There was a cold, unfamiliar look in his eyes, something that made him look a bit dangerous, which was ridiculous because James couldn't even hurt a spider. He's always trapping those things under glasses and releasing them outside. Still, I had a feeling I needed to go with him to make sure things didn't get out of hand. Megan seemed bewildered to find us on her doorstep, which was ludicrous because she had been breaking into our home for weeks and had just stolen a bunch of drugs. She held the door open less than a foot and asked us with faux concern whether George Harrison was all right. I snarled at her. There's no need to bring the cat into this. James isn't a big man, but he was bigger than Megan, and he pushed the door wide open and barreled inside. I followed him, closing the door behind us as Megan's eyes got wide with worry. I started to tell her that she should stop looking so surprised. She was the one who had started all this when I noticed a paperweight pinning down some mail by a table on a table by the front door. And not just any paperweight. It was our paperweight, a glass globe that my late mother had given us as a wedding gift. We kept it in the study, atop the desk whose drawers Megan had raided. It snatched it up and waved it at her. You stole this too? She narrowed her eyes, shook her head, claimed she had no idea what I was talking about. Just give us back our stuff, James said reasonably. She insisted she didn't know what we meant, that she didn't have any of our stuff. Then what's this? I demanded, waving the paperweight at her. She ignored me, looking over my shoulder with wide, frightened eyes. Her mouth dropped open slightly. That's not how she usually looks at James, I thought absurdly. I turned to follow her gaze and saw James was holding a gun at her. Whoa, I said. Where did that come from? That's it, Megan said, all false, false bravado as she pulled her phone from her pocket. I'm calling the cops. But I couldn't let her do that, especially not now, not with James waving around some gun that he got from who knows where. I knew that, but I didn't know what I could do about it. I didn't know that I had done anything about it until I heard James's shocked inhalation and looked down to find Megan crumpled on the carpet. James looked at me, horrified. What did you just do? I looked down at the paperweight in my hand. Blood dripped off the green glass sphere, staining the carpet. I frowned. I had always thought this paperweight was blue. But I couldn't worry about shades of blue and green while there was a woman laying dead on the carpet. We left her there. We didn't know what else to do. We thought back to every Law and Order, Law and Order episode we had ever watched and acted accordingly wiped down any surfaces we might have touched, disposed of my shoes in a random dumpster. James wanted to throw away the paperweight, but I couldn't bear to part with it, so I took it home and washed it lovingly, hid it underneath the bed. And then we held our collective breath. When no one arrived to arrest us the next day, or the day after that, or the week after that, we thought we were in the clear. We thought we got away with murder. And then I came home one afternoon to find George Harrison's dishes in the middle of the living room floor. I swallowed the panic that was rising in my throat and carried the dishes into the kitchen, where, on the kitchen table, was a newspaper clipping held down by two globe-shaped paperweights, one green and one blue. Choking on terror, I peered down at the clipping, Megan's obituary, and written across it in red marker were the words, wrong answer, better luck next time. So, thank you.
You guys probably noticed I jumped up pretty nimbly the first two readings, but I'm too 43-year-old and too out of shape to keep doing that, so I'm doing the stairs from now on. Thank you, Kathleen. We have Kathleen's book to raffle off, so check your tickets for ticket. Oh, no, the number. 144301. <laughs> really? Wow, okay. Is it me? 144300. I, I don't think we did these raffle tickets right. 144308. All right, we'll do one more, then we'll come back. We'll figure out what happened in the break. One four four two five six. Oh, oh, it worked. Okay, good. All right, we're on pace. I'd encourage you not to applaud after the raffle tickets. The winner did nothing, literally nothing to win. <laughs> Our next reader, some schmuck. Oh, it's me. My most recent novel is a cheerfully titled You're As Good As Dead. I also write a monthly column for the Washington Independent Review of Books, and I'm the managing editor of The Thrill Begins on behalf of the International Thrill Writers. For this reading, I'll be joined by jazz singer Sarah Jones. Sarah won the Billie Holiday Vocal Competition and sang for years with the U.S. Army Field Band Soldiers Chorus. She performs at venues throughout the region and teaches at Towson University. This story is called I Love You, But I Don't. Jake hurried through the crowd on Main Street. He loosely held a metal chain in his sweaty right hand. Meredith tugged his left. Come with me, she urged him. Buildings burned on either side of them. The riots had started a half hour earlier, and this section of the city had been abandoned by authority. How much money's gonna be there, Jake asked. Watts, Meredith stopped walking, looked sideways at him as looters rushed past. Are you getting nervous? He stopped with her and shrugged, trying to come off as nonchalant. I'm good. Meredith kept staring. No, I am. It's just, I, I should have brought a shotgun or something instead of this chain. I'm not really a chain guy. But you're a shotgun guy? You're, you're saying that like you don't think I am. I don't. I love you, but I don't. Meredith started walking again. Jake followed her. They've been watching TV in his tiny apartment when the results of the court case had been announced. A white cop who had shot two black children had been acquitted. The shooting had been videotaped, and the cop had shouted racial epithets as he fired. And right before the trial, he'd had, I shoot black people tattooed on his forehead, and I'm definitely guilty tattooed on his neck. But a grand jury still acquitted him. The city had already been close to collapse, and that pushed it too far. Broke something inside of everyone, no matter their race. The crowd thinned as looters headed to the rich stores where the cops waited. Jake followed Meredith in a different direction through side streets until they reached a small secluded shop. M and W musical instruments? Meredith nodded. This door is loaded, trust me. Jake tried the door and it's locked. Meredith looked at the long window facing the street, then downed his chain. It looks like you got a key, she smiled. And that little sp smile sparked something in Jake the way it always did. It took one swing for the entire window to shatter, sprinkling the ground with glass. He hefted the chain in his hand, feeling proud, glanced over at Meredith to see if she was impressed, but she was already walking between rows of instruments. So where's the safe? It's in the office. Meredith walked slowly, like she was wading through water. Her fingers traced the curved wood of a harp. The owner keeps important stuff out of sight. Jake nodded. And how do you know him? He's my husband. Everything stopped. You're, you're married? Just a little bit. A little bit? Jake, it's okay. We're going to separate. He's, he's not very nice to me. I, I can't believe this. This store means everything to him, Meredith said. Let's burn it down. B what? Burn it down? That store across the street's on fire. We can spread it over here. What if someone sees us? Meredith reached into her pocket, pulled out a small silver handgun. Jake pointed. That, that's a gun. I didn't even know you had a gun. You seem more upset about the gun than you are that I'm married. Well, I'm a Democrat. Jake rubbed his forehead. Why do you lie to me? Meredith ignored him, walked deeper into the store. I, I didn't think we'd be together forever, Jake lied as he followed her. But it's been a couple of months. How could you not tell me you're married? 
Meredith wasn't listening. She was staring at something Jake couldn't see. When she spoke again, her voice was soft and dreamy and distant. He taught me to sing. Who? Meredith ignored his question, but it didn't matter. Jake knew who. We'd sit in that small room in the back, facing each other, so close our knees touched. When he shut the door, it was so quiet, it felt like we were buried underground. That was before he changed, before the hitting. Why didn't you tell me any of this? But her mind was somewhere else, her body in two worlds, a foot in each. She started to sing. You don't know what love is until you've learned the meaning of the blues, until you've loved the love you've had to lose. You don't know what love is. You don't know how the lips hurt until you've kissed and had to pay the cost. Until you flipped your heart and you have lost. You don't know what love is. Jake walked out. He stopped and looked back at Meredith one last time, stared at her tall silhouette in the middle of that dark store, and then he left. He walked nearly a mile, dragging his chain behind him like a disappointed snake. Meredith had always seemed unobtainable to him, but there was something about that distance that drew him. No, not the distance, the, the moments it was absent, those surprising moments when she turned toward Jake, completely his, carefree and excited. Walking away from her was unreal, made his insides feel like a box of loose puzzle pieces. And then he heard her singing. You don't know how hearts burn for love that cannot live yet never dies until you faced each dawn with sleepless eyes. You don't know what love is. It was impossible. He was a mile away, and the night wasn't quiet. There were shouts from Main Street, sirens, the low roar of fire. Jake turned and followed the sound all the way back to the shop. He stood in the shadows and stared inside, stared at Meredith's body on the ground and a man kneeling next to her. Jake recognized him from a photo he'd seen on her phone. Who's that, he'd asked. Oh, Meredith had replied, no one, some guy named Will. Now Will rose to his feet and Jake stepped back deeper into the shadows. The nearby fire warmed him, cast enough light for him to see Will walk over to a wall and rest his head against it, and to see the gun Will held. Jake hadn't realized he was inside the store until glass cracked underfoot. He knelt next to Meredith, turned her over, saw the hole where her face used to be. She was trying to burn my store down. Will pointed to a burning two by four in the corner. I saw her carrying that. She was trying to burn my store down. Jake wasn't aware that he was wrapping the chain around his fist. He barely understood he was standing or that he'd thrown a punch. Not until an ache from the chain reverberated up his arm and Will fell back. Will looked for the gun, but had flown out of his hand. Jake punched him again, this time across the jaw. Will hit the floor hard, uncontrolled, unconscious. Jake unrolled the chain from his fist and picked up the gun. He perched his foot on the other man's chest, aimed the gun at his head. This is for Meredith, he said, and fired. The bullet exploded into his own foot. Jake cried out and fell down, grabbing his ankle, the pain making him see white. Meanwhile, the fire had spread to the walls. The front of the store had collapsed. Smoke whirled toward Jake like a sheet. He dragged himself away from it. The entrance should be this way, shouldn't it? Jake wasn't sure anymore. He was blind to the dark, coughing, his foot bursting in pain. Smoke filled his mouth until it felt like something solid had lodged in his throat. Jake tried another direction, still blind. His arms gave out as the smoke thickened. Everything around him burned. The end. Thanks. And thanks to Sarah. Isn't she really good? Isn't she great? <laughs> so I got a copy of my latest book to raffle off, and Sarah has two copies of her CD, Daydream a Little. So if this works right, 144292. One four four two nine two. Oh, Molly, you, you can get Sarah's CD. That's a good one. Yeah, she has my book. 
144298. Ah, oh, sorry. And the other copy is Sarah CD. And one four four three oh six. One four four three oh six. All right. One four four three oh five. Really? Okay, we'll do one more. One four four two nine seven. No one really? Okay, all right. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not good at raffling. <laughs> Colleen Shogun is the author of the Washington Whodunit Mystery Series featuring Capitol Hill detective Kit Marshall. Calamity at the Continental Club, the third book in the series, came out in July of this year. She won a Next Generation Indie Award for Best Mystery in 2016 and was a Rowan finalist for Mystery in 2017. She works at the Library of Congress and helps lead the division responsible for the National Book Festival. So everyone here has to be really nice to her if you want to come back next year. An inexplicably proud Pittsburgh native, Colleen now lives in Arlington, Virginia with her husband Rob and her beagle mutt, Conan. Here's Colleen Shogun. Thanks, Ed. It's been a long day, but I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, and I hope in future years for the book festival, we're able to do even more evening programming featuring local writers and authors. Um, that's sort of our goal, and we hope to build that out in future years for the book festival. So stay tuned and keep coming to see us year after year. I'm going to read a chapter from my latest book, Calamity at the Continental Club. And as Ed said, um, I'll give you a little bit of a setup. Uh, Kit Marshall is a Capitol Hill, Washington, D.C. sleuth. And in this installment of the series, she's um, attending a historical society um, uh, reception and weekend at a very fancy Washington, D.C. members-only club called the Continental Club. And as usually what happens to Kit, she happens to find a, a dead body. So this is the point in the story in which you know, the mystery really gets started. Without a moment's hesitation, I sprung to the man's side. The face was contorted, but I still recognized him. It was Grayson Bancroft, dressed in the same suit he'd worn to dinner. Obviously, Grayson never made it to bed last night. His skin was extremely pale, not a good sign. Tentatively, I reached to feel for a pulse. After grasping his stone-cold hand for only a second, I recoiled. The president of the Mayflower Society was dead. Now it was time to panic. The eerie silence consuming the entire building prevented me from letting out a scream. Instead, I scrambled around the corner and flew down the last flight of stairs to reach the main entrance. The concierge desk sat empty. Didn't anyone start the day early in Washington, even at the Continental Club? The delicious aroma of freshly baked rolls wafted in my direction. Of course, the Continental Club was a prime location for a Beltway Power breakfast. I followed my nose, which led me to the entrance of the garden dining room. Two well-dressed businessmen were waiting to be seated. Can someone help me, I asked. My black capri running pants, a hoodie, and yellow tennis shoes didn't inspire confidence. The club's host took one look at me and wrinkled his nose. I'll be with you in a moment, ma'am, as soon as I seat these two gentlemen. Given the circumstances, waiting was out of the question. Sir, I'm sorry, but I need your assistance now. My voice was only a few decibels shy of a screen. I've gotten his attention. Please, I have to ask you to wait your turn. The two men in suits shook their heads in disgust. He left me no choice. I hadn't wanted to spoil breakfast for the eager diners. There's a dead man upstairs. He's inside the library. That did it. All three men stared at me, mouths agape. Given their reactions, I might as well have announced the arrival of Queen Elizabeth's corpse. The, house, the host stammered, what did you say? I cleared my throat and spoke in my clearest, most sophisticated voice. His name is Grayson Bancroft. I don't know what happened to him, but someone might want to attend to the matter. I turned on my heels and retreated. The club staffer followed behind, apparently deciding that the two guests were no longer a priority. When he caught up with me, he put his hand on my shoulder. Can you show me? And his voice trailed off. I turned to face him. The body? He gulped, yes. Follow me. I motioned toward the stairs. 
Once we reached the first floor landing, we continued past the portrait and reached Franklin's statue. I pointed in the direction of the library entrance. Fortunately, although not for Grayson, the body remained in exactly the same spot. He's the leader of the historical society group we're hosting for the next three days, the host said. Despite my best efforts, I couldn't hide my exasperation. That's what I was trying to tell you. He knelt down besides Bancroft. Are you sure he's dead? I'm no medical examiner, but his hand is cold and I can't detect a pulse. And he's not breathing. If you could stay here, I'm gonna call an ambulance and the police. I nodded. If I'd had my phone, I could have texted Doug until the alerts on his device woke him. My best laid plans for a jog this morning had gone awry. I squatted next to the body for a closer look. The twisted features definitely belonged to the man I met the night before, enough to make a positive identification. Unfortunately, Bancroft didn't seem to be at peace. Grayson had been in relatively good shape. His weight appeared average, and he was likely a few years shy of Medicare eligibility. If he suffered from an illness like cancer, the effects of such a serious disease certainly weren't apparent. Was it a heart attack? Perhaps he smoked. I got closer to his face and sniffed. I was particularly sensitive to the smell of cigarettes. Although I detected the lingering fragrance of a men's cologne, there was no hint of tobacco. Something seemed odd about the placement of the body. If he'd been a victim of cardiac arrest, wouldn't he have fallen to the ground in a crumpled heap? Instead, Bancroft was lying perfectly flat on his back, arms and legs spread wide. It was as though he'd been in, in the middle of making a snow angel when he died. I returned to the library and bent down again. The expression on his face seemed frozen, like something out of the ordinary had happened to him and he'd been unable to react. There was no other way to describe it. Grayson Bancroft had been surprised to die. When staring at the expression of shock on Bancroft's face, I noted a small red mark on the dead man's neck. It was on the left side, inches above the fitted collar of his button-down dress shirt. It was quite noticeable, and I was almost certain it hadn't been there the night before. Leaning over the body, I moved closer to, to for a better look. It wasn't a birthmark or a mosquito bite. To my untrained eye, it appeared to be a puncture wound. Who are you and what are you doing? I drew back immediately at the sound of an authoritative female voice. A petite woman whipped out a badge and flashed it. Detective Maggie Glass, DC Metro Police. I stood up and offered her my hand. Kit Marshall, I discovered the body. The detective was joined by several EMTs. Their visit would be brief because I was certain that Grayson Bancroft was deceased. I moved away while the emergency medical personnel surrounded the body and confirmed the death. Glass motioned me for me to exit the library. The middle-aged detective was short in stature, but I could tell she meant business. Her brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail, and she wore a fitted black suit that was professional, yet also sporty in case a hot pursuit was called for. Silver button earrings provided a feminine touch. She pulled out a notebook and grabbed a pen from her jacket pocket. Ms. Marshall, you're a guest here at the Continental Club? I briefly described the reason for our visit and explained I lived in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Where do you work? Apparently, even the district police asked this question as an opener. Maybe they also attended too many K Street cocktail parties. Capitol Hill, I work for a chief of staff for a member of the House of Representatives. A political type, I see. No surprises there. How did you come to discover the deceased? My workout attire corroborated my story, and Glass didn't question why I stumbled across Grayson. She continued to write furiously in her notebook. Without looking up, she kept talking. Only a few more questions, Ms. Marshall. This seems open and shut. The coroner will take it from here. It was most likely a heart attack or an aneurysm. We see these all the time in men of the deceased age group. I cleared my throat. That got Glass's attention. She glanced up from scribbling furiously in her notepad and asked, do you have something to add? Detective, I'm sure you noticed the odd position of the body on the floor. Not really. I wanted to let our medical experts confirm the death. Let's take another look. She motioned with a pen that I should follow her inside the library. Glass circled the body several times and paused to write in her notebook. She indicated the medic should join us. Fellas, does this look like a heart attack or an otherwise natural death to you? The younger guy shook his head. Seems weird, like he was hit the ground and just froze. The other EMT rubbed his chin. Can't say I've seen anything like this in real life. It reminds me of something I saw on cable TV. What do you mean, I asked. You know, one of those channels with the historical documentaries? It's like that town in Italy where the volcano erupted thousands of years ago. Pompeii, I offered. He raised a triumphant finger. You've got it. Everyone was killed and then preserved instantly by ash. This guy looks like one of those unlucky people. Stopped dead in his tracks. 
Glass stared at the paramedic for a long moment before speaking. Well, one thing's for certain, there was no volcano in the middle of the Continental Club, so what killed him? The detective bent down to take a closer look. She immediately noticed the red mark in the dead man's neck and motioned for the History Channel watching medic to join her. What do you see here? Is it a wound, a bug bite? The paramedic hesitated, almost as if to say that answering her question exceeded his pay grade. But he complied without protest, even whipping out a small pen light to shine on Bancroft's neck. I'm not a medical examiner, ma'am, but that's not from a mosquito, he concluded. Glass grabbed the pen light and peered at the small blotch. That's helpful, but what is it? Maybe an injection site? You can see the dot in the center. There's a bit of blood around it. Detective Glass must have agreed with the medic's conclusion. After examining Grayson's neck again, she leaned back and said, thank you for your help. Everything had happened so fast, I hadn't had much time to think about the consequences of finding the mysterious mark on Bancroft's body. An odd and inauspicious start to my morning had suddenly turned into something more sinister. Detective Glass jotted down more notes and tapped her pen to her forehead. To no one in particular, she stated the obvious. I don't like how this is shaping up. I drew nearer. Detective, I'm clearly not going for a run this morning. Do you mind if I return to my room so I can speak with my fiance and put on more appropriate clothes? With an absent-minded sideways glance, Glass answered, of course. Then she quickly added, don't go anywhere else, Ms. Marshall. You may have just become a key witness to a murder. I was no stranger to those fateful words. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Oh, we could do the raffle. Do you have a book to give away? She does. All right, calling number 144255. Oh, somebody, okay, so it worked kinda. Con Lehane's newest book, Murder at the 42nd Street Library, came out earlier this year from Minotaur. It's the first in a new series featuring Raymond Ambler, curator at the 42nd Street Library's fictional crime fiction collection. He's also been published in Alfred Hitchcock's Mystery Magazine and has a different mystery series featuring a New York City bartender named Brian McNulty. Over the years, Khan has been a college professor, union organizer, labor journalist, disciple, and has tended bar at two dozen or so drinking establishments. He teaches fiction writing and mystery writing at the Writer's Center in Bethesda, and is the only person I know who still uses a fax machine. Here's Khan Lahane. <laughs> I'm really surprised about that fax machine thing. Is that a I, I, I didn't know they'd been replaced. I also think this is the, 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 the first time in the history of noirs at the bar that, that we've had uh, a signing interpreters. Uh, so uh, thank you. It, it, it's, a, it's a great... Um, so Ed said who um, the, the series is. So that, that pretty much covers. This is the second book. In, in the series, it's called Murder in the Manuscript Room, and it's coming out uh, in November. Maybe, uh, all right, so I'm gonna read a short section that you should be able to follow. Ambler is the Raymond Ambler, the curator of the crime fiction collection at the, at the New York Public Library, at the 42nd Street Library. What, what struck Ambler was a coincidence. A week before, he'd gotten a call from an upstate prison. Uh, from Actually, he, the, the call was from his son, who uh, is in prison. You have to read the first book to understand why, why he was there. But a lifer there told his son he was a friend of his father and wanted to talk to him. The prisoner, Devon Thomas, in fact, had been Ambler's friend, a very good friend. Uh, from sixth grade until Devon dropped out of high school at 16 to run with the Black People's Party, the last time Ambler had seen him, except in a daily news photo wearing handcuffs. On his monthly visit to his son the previous Saturday, Ambler looked up his friend. Devon told him he was in prison for a murder he didn't commit. 
My kid brother did the murder, Devin told him. His hard stare faltered. Trey was a snitch. I took the rap because I knew someone would kill him in here. And now, Ambler asked, he died a couple of weeks ago. A skeptical person might doubt Devin's story, that he'd spent his adult life in prison for a crime he didn't commit out of loyalty to his brother. Ambler believed him. He'd met Devin in sixth grade at a new school for Ambler. The first day, he was surrounded in a hallway by a half dozen would-be, he was surrounded in a hallway by a half dozen would-be hoodlums taunting him for some imagined or fabricated slight. When he felt an arm around his shoulder, it was Devin who amiably brushed aside the thugs and walked them into the classroom. Ambler knew some of the history behind Devin's arrest and conviction because it was major news in the tabloids at the time. In the early 80s, a group of truck drivers took on a corrupt union in the garment trucking industry. One of the leaders of the insurgents, Richard Wright, was murdered shortly after he was elected president of the local in a government-monitored election. Devin Thomas killed him, the newspapers said, in a feud between rival gangs over drug territory. No way I'd kill him, Devin said. I loved him like a father. Trey was a rat, a snitch. I didn't know, never thought it, never suspected until he got scared and told me. Told me his handler told him to off Richard. When he told me I wanted to kill Trey myself, you become a snitch because you're paid or you do it to keep yourself out of prison. His handler from the NYPD told Trey he'd get off. Then something went wrong and the handler told Trey he'd have to plead to manslaughter. They'd get him out in three years. Trey told me he whacked Richard and was going up for it. I couldn't let him do it. I took the rap. I thought I'd get the same deal. But they told Trey, manslaughter, a three-year bid. Ha, I got life. Devin's hair, still kinky, had turned gray. Tight curls now, where years before it was a giant afro. His eyes were clear, still hard. Still something friendly in them, too a flash of kindness behind the heart. His skin darker than Ambler remembered, his features as much European as African, a slender nose, thin lips. He developed a prison body, muscular, athletic. As he talked, he'd reach out now and again, putting his hand on Ambler's forearm to make sure he had his attention, to reinforce the connection. He did this now. Trey got the AIDS. I got compassion leave to visit him in the hospice. He was out of his head a lot. Right before he died, he told me he didn't kill Richard. They killed him. Who's they, Ambler asked. Devin shook his head. I don't know. I got some ideas. I've been going back over what happened back then. I'm using the prison library, but it's slow. I thought you might see what you can find in that library of yours about what happened back then. I read about you. That's what you do, right? You find out what really happened when someone was killed? Not, exa not exactly, Ambler said. You can tell the truth now, right? Your brother's dead. You didn't commit the murder. Devin's eyes locked on Ambler's. Who'd believe me? Ambler nodded. I know you, Ray. We were bros. Devin laughed. It began as a kind of giggle, catching on like an uncertain motor until it became a chuckle, and then a full-out laugh. The sound of it rolled back the years to the endless summers. He and Devin, baseball gloves and bats over their shoulders, rambled through Flatbush, seeking out pickup games in schoolyards and vacant lots. The nights they played stickball under the streetlights between the parked cars on Ethan 19th Street off Beverly Road. Okay, that's it. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have a, a a book to raffle off. If
You think it can handle it, Ed? <laughs> Thank you, Khan. Please leave the stage. <laughs> Khan has a book to raffle off, and the lucky winner is you. You applaud for for raffle? Oh no, I. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm oh, sorry. It's <laughs> very confused. One four four two nine six. Oh, hey, the lovely lady in the in the back. That's my mom. <laughs> Sean Riley Simmons is the author of the Red Carpet Catering Mysteries featuring Penelope, Penelope Sutherland, an on-set movie caterer, and has several short stories appearing in various anthologies. She, she serves on the board of Malice Domestic as a member of the Dames of the Detection and an editor at Level Best Books, which has published many award-winning anthologies that writers are often desperate to appear in and will do anything to curry her favor. On an unrelated note, Sean, you're, you're very pretty. Here she is. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. You're very pretty, too. Um, I'm going to read a story called Humble Pie, and it appears in this anthology, Noir at the Salad Bar, Culinary Tales with a Bite, sort of the anti-cozy culinary anthology. Humble Pie. Ivy always gave me that look, her tight, prissy little lip twist, the laugh I could see right behind her eyes. I smiled back like I always do and stepped up to her judging table to set down my pie. Same kind as last year, Ivy said with a small shake of her head. I love mincemeat pie, especially near to the holidays. I smiled again. Well, good luck to you then, sissy. This might finally be your year. Sissy, she was always calling me that, even though she knew damn well I was married now and should be called Mrs. Cecilia Burns if she wanted to be proper. Ivy's eyes opened wide and she fussed at her orange polka dotted scarf when she saw Jean Brody walking up with a lattice-topped deep dish apple. She just about toppled her chair over backwards, jerking up like that from her seat, reaching across the table to take the pie from Jean, acting all friendly and whatnot. I heard Ivy call Jean a dirty bitch B-word once in the bathroom back in school just because her daddy owned the junkyard and repair shop. Ivy didn't know I heard her. I had my feet propped up on the toilet like I used to do so I could hear what those girls were saying when they thought no one was around. I guess Ivy thinks Jean's all right now since she's rich on account of her husband owning one of the one and only car dealership in town. Owned. It's Jean's now. Her husband fell over one day on the lot a year or so back, right in front of a couple he'd just taken for a test drive in a brand new Buick Riviera. I heard he clutched his chest and called out for Jean. He was romantic like that. Jean, you just have to come up to our next fundraiser, Ivy said through her smile, still tugging at her scarf in that anxious way of hers. We're raising money to buy a new nativity scene for the square. So I've heard, said Jean. She folded her hands in front of her, showing off her expensive leather gloves. I like your scarf, I interrupted. Jean and Ivy both looked at me. Ivy smirked and tilted her head, then turned back to Jean. Jean squinted at me like I had a toe growing between my eyes. Like I was saying, the little Christ baby from our old nativity, the paint's all worn away. It's not right having him sit out there all chip-faced and decrepit. It goes against God. How are you doing, Cecilia? Jean Brody had asked me a question. Fine, thanks, and you? I'm all right, and how is Mr. Burns? I beamed and reached up a hand to straighten my hat. We're both just fine, thanks for asking. Glad to hear it, Jean said. I do see your husband from time to time, always out and about in his tow truck. Sometimes he pulls old trade-ins to the lot that don't run anymore. Oh, he's on the road all the time, I said, tripping over my words. We'd have two or three babies by now if he could just be home more often. Yes, I'm sure that's true, Jean said wistfully. Just remember, life's little blessings come along right when they're supposed to. I nodded and smiled like I always do. The children at the next table rub sticky paint onto maple leaves and press them onto construction paper. I just remember, Jean said, acting all surprised. Ivy, weren't you and Marvin, king and queen of the Fall Fest back in the day? Oh, yes, we were, Ivy said, acting like she couldn't quite remember. But that was so long ago. 
Yes, I suppose we've all gotten a lot older. Well, you ladies enjoy the season, Jean said in her grand way. She waved to someone in the crowd and drifted off. I turned back to Ivy. Her eyes burned into the back of Jean's cashmere coat. She had that same look on her face that she did back in school, but this time she was too afraid to call Gina, a B-word, out loud in public, now that we were all grown-ups. A surprise bubble of laughter rolled up my chest and I coughed into my fist to keep it down. I sat on a cold metal folding chair and watched the rest of the Fall Fest pies come in. I knew mine was different. It would be the one they'd all be talking about after. When it came time for judging, Ivy and her friends hovered over the gingham tablecloth, all official and whatnot, in their frilly aprons. They tasted little bits of pie from their plastic forks, acting out for all of us like they didn't ever take big bites of anything. Then they joked about getting fat and watching their waistlines, like judging a pie contest was the last thing they wanted to be doing. I watched especially close when Ivy tasted mine. I pressed my own hand to my narrow side. It was almost done hurting from that last time. Marvin was good about leaving the marks under my clothes, so when I was out and about in town, no one could see my black and blues. I could keep my head up and look at everyone in the eye that way. I slipped my hand into my pocket and felt the folded piece of paper, smooth at the edges, from all those times I had folded it and refolded it ever since I found it last week on laundry day. We have a winner, Ivy shouted. She stuck the big blue ribbon on the table in front of Jean's apple pie. Some people tried to clap through their gloves while balancing flimsy cups of cider in their hands. They sounded like that hurt bird I found in the yard that time, flapping its wings for no reason just because it thought it should. I knew that bird would never fly again. Jean made her way to the table and took a flowery bow, thanking all the judges one by one. She took an extra long time thanking Ivy, holding both her hands with her own and pumping them up and down. They looked like a couple of overdressed milkmaids churning a pot of butter. Then Jean turned and smiled right at me before she wandered off in the crowd, ribbon in hand. I heard a few sirens that night, but they were too far off for me to play a sweat part of town. I was in my usual chair at the kitchen table, the radio playing John Coltrane, low from the counter. Marvin didn't have a taste for music that he said white people had nothing to do with, so I always kept an eye out for the headlights so I could turn it off quick, just to keep him from shouting about it. I ate my pie slowly, one bite of mincemeat, then a bite of apple, taking sips of black coffee in between. The letter I found written in that prissy tight handwriting lay open on the table. I read it maybe a hundred times. Ivy still made those little curly Q shapes on her Ys, like she hadn't grown up at all. I bid on both pies after the contest. Had to pay a lot more for jeans than mine, of course. The headlights skittered across the windows and I looked up, my heartbeat slowing to a thud. I folded Ivy's note and put it in my apron pocket. My legs tingled when I stood up and went to shut off the radio. The clock told me I'd been sitting there for over an hour. I'd eaten almost half of both pies. The kitchen door rattled open. They're gone, Jean said, her cheeks flushed. She pulled her hat off and let her hair spill down over her shoulders. Gone, I asked. They're dead, Jean said. Brake failure out on the new two-lane highway, headlong collision with a big wheeler. Marvin's tow truck was parked at the edge of the fall fest lot, just took one snip. What about the truck driver? Is he all right, I asked. Jean barked out a laugh and pulled off her gloves, her fingers black with grease. He'll live. It's all perfect. Jean put her hands on my cheeks and pulled me close. She kissed me that way that I like, gentle at first, then more grown up her tongue slanting up against mine. I kissed her back like I always do. I got you something, she said when we came up for air. What? She pulled Ivy's orange polka dotted scarf from her coat pocket and handed it to me. How did you get this? Ivy gave it to me when I promised to come to the next fundraiser. Jean laughed so hard she lost her breath. I smiled and kissed her again, like I always do. Thank you, Sean. Sean is raffling off a copy of the anthology her book appeared in, and the lucky number is 144310. Oh, okay. All right, I'll bring it to you. Yeah. Okay. James Grady's first novel became Robert Redford's Three Days of the Condor. Aren't you fancy, James? And is under development for a TV series scheduled for next year. Since Condor, Grady's published more than a dozen novels and three times as many short stories across genres, working in Hollywood as a screenwriter for HBO and CBS and as a staff writer for the late TV Empire creator Stephen Cannell. He spent four years as an investigative reporter here in D.C. and has won literary awards from Japan, Italy, and France. Montana born and raised, Grady now lives just up the red line in Silver Spring. As an FYI, 
I asked, and no, he will not introduce you to Robert Redford. But here's James Grady. I thought Robert Redford was coming to hear Khan read, so I've been looking around hoping to spot him, but I must have been misinformed. This is such a, a gas to be here at the National Book Festival, and it's a double gas because the book I'm reading from, Montana Noir, comes out Tuesday. The Montana Noir anthology of short fiction is part of a astonishing legacy that now encompasses 80 books published in, I think, 19 countries. There have been two DC noir collections. I hope there will be a third. My short story takes place eventually in my hometown of Shelby. The story is called The Road You Take. A big blue sky arced over that prairie highway driven by a lone white minivan. Roxy Road behind Desiree, who'd called shotgun when they left last night's motel in a pine trees and good money town across the mountains. Shotgun meant riding next to bear, 300 plus pounds of watch out crammed behind the steering wheel. He stank weed he wouldn't share cigarettes and whiskey. Plus, you might catch a paw if he thought you'd sassed, or he simply got the itch to pop somebody. But Desiree packed 60 extra pounds of flesh on her 5'8 in stiletto heels frame, and the big girl knew how to take a hit. <clears throat> Cherry Road on Roxy's left, past the cooler behind Bear. Her golden blonde dye job had more class than Desiree's motel sink peroxide. Cherry craned to see where they were going, as if there were some destination besides the next gig. She was a few high school years ahead of Roxy, who wondered if somewhere under heaven there was a letter or email inviting her real name to her class's 10-year reunion. That notion made Roxy laugh as the white van rumbled her life away. What's so funny, mumbled Star from the way back, where she rode slumped amid suitcases, sound system speakers, cables, mini spots, makeup and costume bag, telescoping dancing poles, and the deflated ring for bikini wrestling gigs. What isn't funny? Cherry arched her back to stretch. Potholes on this two-lane highway across the top of the state rattled the minivan, but Roxy saw no tremble in the, tremble in the breasts some surgeon beat, built beneath Cherry's red sweater. Roxy thought, wonder if Cherry paid back the loan, plus Vig Luke fronted her for that work. Wonder how much longer I can keep him from helping me go under some knife. Star said, nothing funny about one of you skimming my stash. Not me, said Desiree. And no way, it's Bear. Crystal would make his head fart. Whoosh, came Bear's backhand toward Desiree. Missed because a gopher ran across the road. Made him swerve the minivan and messed up his aim. Almost, said Cherry of the attempted varmint murder. Star, Luke's rules say no rips no holdbacks, so there's no thieves in this ride. Bear growled, don't talk about Luke, I'm road boss, and no more you asking to drive or cozying up to the man. I'm just trying to stick to my place, said Cherry. Roxy said, nobody's skimming you, Star. You could tell, tweakers, no tweakers. So far, steer, Star steered clear of the needle and the pipe, only sniffing. She kept her high cheekbones, tawny-haired, stop-traffic beauty, her teeth and her tight TNA, no tremor in her pony legs when she stripped. 
but her eyes were always black holes. Catch some sleep, Roxy told the beauty in the way back. Sleep is when they get you, said Star. You can really get got when you're tweaked, said Desiree. Don't care then. Desiree stared out the windshield. There's a whole lot of out there, out there. The western third of the state was the Rocky Mountains marching down from Canada. Pine tree crags soaring more than a mile above sea level. East of the mountains meant scrub grass prairies and chessboard brown and gold fields of rotated crops, which, if you weren't born, born there, looked like one terrifying big empty. In the two weeks Roxy had gone to community college, a teacher had said Montana held seven regions, each bigger than many other states. Where she was now was the High Line, named for the railroad built after the Civil War by a tycoon who got free land along his tracks from the federal government, got the feds to create cargo and passengers for his trains with public land giveaways to homesteaders who didn't understand it rained next to never out there. Before Roxy's lifetime, when the glaciers melted, 40 below zero blizzards roared over the prairies a few times a year. Most homesteaders fled, died, or went crazy. The ones who stayed leathered up rough and tough. Like me, Roxy's eyes found the van's mirror. What the locals saw when she stripped was chopped hair the color of dirt, nothing special behind, and up front too small for no more than $5 tips. Ice eyes. And no matter the hoots, hollers, and creep games, nobody ever saw more than what she was tough enough to sell. Except Paul. Dead rabbit on the road. Bear swerved to run over it. His mirror showed him mountains sneak, shrinking 40 miles behind them. They rolled east out to the prairies, blew through browning on the Blackfeet Reservation, barreled through Cutbank like, like that town wasn't there. Coming up on the left horizon, Roxy saw three blue humps, the Sweetgrass Hills, many mountains left over from dinosaur days. She stared out the window, said, here come the space aliens. Like an army of giants, 10 stories tall, a hundred windmills with spinning white bay blades rose from the prairie. Big money invaders that, in harmony with Montana's history, were built elsewhere and sent electricity from the local wind out of state. A dozen, a dozen miles beyond the army of windmills waited Shelby and Paul. Yay, I got cell service, okay. Desiree said, waving her cell phone, registered by Luke through some gonna busted account. Promise I'll work my geeks, but first I need me some Candy Crush. Every circuit girl had a website for credit card chats and private downloads with viruses run by some hacker in Russia. Once Luke's crew had gotten all they were gonna get from a cyber troll, that citizen might find his credit crashed and his bank tapped. A touch of that coming back to Luke to be washed in his payday dollars now, yellow shack on Bozeman strips of warehouses, seedy motels, and bars. Luke kicked a slice of the hack score back to the woman he put online. Minus any vig they owed him. Then there's the cash from the dates. Roxy didn't do that. Yet, Cherry had whispered to her a week before in Lincoln, the truckers and Unabomber town in the mountains in, there in Lincoln. Roxy caught Cherry sneaking back into the diner from the highway patrol cruiser parked out back from the badge who had a kink Cherry parlayed into lawman tips that got her nods from Luke. But that badge wasn't clocked to meet up with Cherry on this circuit. Cherry saw herself caught in Roxy's eyes, 
put a finger to her smeared ruby lips. We all got secrets. Now on that April morning, the white van rushed past the wind farm army of towers. Shadows from the spinning blades slash Roxy. Cherry told the driver, your belt's packing the tape just fine. Shut up about my belt or you'll get it, growled Bear. Cherry ignored him, gave Roxy a look about, about the take. There's the take and there's the books. The books are the circuit's fee plus a cut of the door at bars, bachelor blowouts, or frat house gigs. Negotiated taxes on beers and booze, payouts for gas and motel rooms, and independent contractor fees to the stable. The books are for the law. The take is everything else. A cut of all the presidents tucked into G-strings or tossed on a beer-stained floor. Half the dollars from dates cleared by the Rose boss, road boss that Roxy still said no to. Desiree said yes to such gotta pay dates from the same kind of guys who mocked her as fatty back in high school. So who's laughing now, huh? Cherry picked, they all joked, referring to the big shots who were re reeled in by the blonde with big breasts and big ideas. Star let any guy with the right cash hang her up in whatever night he wanted. But the major dollars in the take came from the envelopes that nameless mooks brought to bear as they traveled the road, cash laundered into the books as gross income. The books and the take, what they say you do and what you really get. White signs on a green road sign read, Shelby, seven miles. Bear's eyes goaded Roxy from the rear view mirror. Maybe I'll stop. Shelby'd been a gig on the circuit last month. A mesa rim flowed off to Roxy's left. Up on the right, she saw the truck size flapping American flag near the highway crossroads. One road through town, the other to Canada or toward Great Falls, past the electrified chain fence of a private prison. The books claimed they'd done great the first night of their doubleheader gig in Shelby at Jammers, a former trackside slaughterhouse renovated to a bar with a liquor license acquired from a gone broke tavern in polluted poison Libby, 246 miles away in the pine forested mountains of the northwest corner of the state. Jammer's owner clung to Shelby's dreams that wind farm workers and prison guards someday were going to drop enough dollars in town to banish the whitewash windows off Main Street. Thank you. You can always tell a Montana story because it has the word varmint in it. <laughs> Sujata Massey's Ray Shimura series has been nominated for the Edgar, Anthony, and Mary Higgins Clark Awards and won the Agatha and McCavity. She's also the author of The Sleeping Dictionary and India Gray Historical Fiction. She has a new series coming in January from Soho Press featuring Bombay's first female lawyer in the 20s. The first book in the series is titled The Widows of Malabar Hill. On a personal note, she's one of the first thriller writers I ever read seriously and admire her a great deal, so I'm not gonna poke fun of her. Instead, I'll make fun of Khan really quick. Of course, nobody uses fax machines anymore. That's so outdated. Why would anyone use a fax machine? Here's Sujata. Hey, I'm so surprised everybody is still around for the last reader. But then I sat down in one of those chairs and I realized how incredibly comfortable they are. I mean, we should have these chairs and bean bags everywhere that we appear. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit from that first book in the new series that Ed mentioned, um, The Widows of Malabar Hill. And the lead character in this book who's gonna be narrating this section that you hear is named Purveen Mystery. 
and she's a young woman lawyer. In fact, she's the first woman lawyer in Bombay. And um, she gets into a lot of tight spots as a woman lawyer doing this, this difficult job. And um, you'll see where she is. I think you'll figure out what happened to her just as she's figuring it out too. Cat out of the bag, Bombay, February 1921. When Praveen awoke, her throat felt dry, although her body was soaked. She'd sweated, maybe for hours. Was, she was wrapped up in a thick, rough blanket. Reaching out a few inches, she tried to tug the cloth down, but it just pulled tighter around her curled up form. And then she remembered Bruce Street and the shock of a cloth sack coming down over her head. She had a memory of fighting against it and then being hit. She recalled a bumpy ride and being hauled out and hearing the lapping sound of water. She braced for the feeling of sinking like a stone into cold water. She knew she'd end her life in the Arabian Sea, the body of water her ancestors had crossed to build their new lives in India. At the Calcutta High Court, Cyrus had sworn vengeance on her. The years between that time had been filled with the excitement of Oxford returning to Bombay and working as a full-fledged solicitor in her father's practice. Until the last few days, she'd relinquished her fears. The attack had caught her off guard, despite the warning signs, and the plan would come off without a hitch. Her parents didn't know about anything amiss, and enough time had passed so there'd be no suspicion of the Sotawala family. And her death, once it was discovered, would allow Cyrus to marry a new wife. A loud ship's horn interrupted her thoughts, reminding her of another possibility. She recalled the hulking figure of Giant's boss, Ravi. Ravi had been furious about the changes Giant's legal victory had brought about for all the stevedores. As revenge against her father, Praveen, who'd shown her face at the docks, could have been abducted. Now she'd be left to die, and Ravi would escape persecution. But there was also the Farid situation. Someone involved might worry she was getting close to the truth. The telephone call from a woman that had brought her out at night could have been a ploy, and the disabling of Ramchandra's rickshaw had been intentional. This, of course, pointed to the attacker being connected to the caller. She'd been taken around eight in the evening. What time was it now? She slid her stiff right hand over her left forearm until she felt the rectangular face of her French wristwatch. She could not read the time in the dark, but it was comforting to still have it. She wondered if she had anything else. Groping with both hands, she found her beaded purse trapped in a corner of the sack near her feet. How surprising the assailant hadn't taken it. Perhaps it was meant to be an identifier after she was nothing more than a pile of bones. The fact she'd been left alive might mean somebody was nearby keeping guard. She wanted to know. Clearing her scratchy throat, she began shouting in Marathi. What are you doing sticking me in a bag like this? Kidnapping's a crime. She shouted for five minutes, changing the language to Hindi and then to English, steadily raising her level of profanity. Hearing nothing but silence, she gathered she was alone. If she were truly alone, she could try to escape the bag without interference. Feeling more determined than frightened now, Praveen began exploring the scratchy sack. The top end was sewn straight across, but the end near her feet was drawn tightly together as if it had been tied with a rope. She could not possibly untie something knotted on the outside. The only way out would be to tear the straight edge. Praveen searched through her small beaded purse, which contained a few coins, business cards, the vial of rose attar, and her mother of pearl fountain pen. She removed a metal hairpin from her braided coronet and tried to stab it through the cloth. The thin pin broke on the fifth attempt. But she really needed a sharp bit of metal. She thought of the whale bones inside her brassiere, but she didn't have enough space to move her arms to unhook her blouse. 
So she took the fountain pen and rubbed its nib against the sharp broken hairpin. It took only a few minutes of industrious work to give the pen's nib a knife-like sharpness. She was elated when she pushed the pen into the bag's fabric and it went through. Diligently, she stabbed the cloth until she made an opening of a few inches. Then with her hands, she tore it open the rest of the way. Squeezing herself out, she slowly released her arms and legs from the tight ball they'd been in. Her right foot throbbed with pain, and so did some spots in her back and one elbow. But she was free in a short, dark space that smelled of dust. Groping around, she identified many more sacks around her. The crowding gave the impression she was in a storeroom, perhaps one of the many go-downs built in rows near the harbor or at Ballard Pier itself. Goods were held for months and sometimes years in the go-downs. She remembered her brother Rustam's frustration about a shipload of nails that should have been delivered to Mystery Construction but had been accidentally stored after the unloading and forever lost. She tried to think logically. She'd been loaded into this place. There had to be a way to the outside. First, she searched the low ceiling, hoping to find the base of a chute. There was none, at least not near her. She shifted her investigation to the cold cement walls around the sacks. Moving made her feel the impact of being in a windowless, doorless box. She was becoming frightened and realized that not knowing where she was in relation to the bag she'd broken out of made her feel lost. Praveen said a silent prayer, and afterward, her mind felt clear. If she'd been brought to a place already filled with goods, she'd probably been left close to the front of this space and whatever door existed. She crawled back to the spot where the destroyed bag lay. Then she sat down and felt everything around it. A raised edge on the wooden base caught her attention. When she touched it, she realized it was one edge of a large wooden square. She was able to pry up the square and pushed one of her hands through. Her initial confusion was followed by the realization that she'd been loaded up onto a shelf. This was the reason for the very low ceiling above her head. The way out was to drop down to the next level, though how steep the fall would be and what she'd land on was unknown. Sometimes people kept guard dogs in the storerooms. There were even rumors of certain merchants keeping snakes, which would dissuade both thieves and rats. She whistled to see if a dog might move below, but there was no sound in response. Perveen slowly fit herself through the opening, feeling her way down with her feet. But then her tired arms couldn't hold her anymore. She slipped straight down, landing in a sitting position on another group of sacks. She sat there for a while, making sure no bones were broken. Although when she gathered the strength to stand, she had a searing pain in her hip. Resolutely, she bumped her way around the room to the area where she saw some thin streaks of light. A ventilated wooden door, she decided after exploring it with her fingers. Unfortunately, it was locked. Pressing her eyes to the narrow bits of light, she realized the door was near an area with people. She heard the rumble of men's voices and again, the blowing of a ship's horn. She must be at the harbor very close by. If she could hear voices, that also meant someone might hear her. Help me, she called in English and then in Marathi. She shouted again and again, but nobody heard. Perhaps it was still too early or the storeroom too distant. Starting around seven, the dock became lively, but then there might be too much noise for a tiny cry to be heard. She had to draw attention to the door in the hopes that the earliest workers, the tea makers, the sweepers, and the dock loaders might hear. Praveen put her hand in her purse. She could write a note and push it through one of the ventilation holes, but the laborers reporting to work were all illiterate. Then she felt the cool glass of the vial of rose attar. If she spilled it, she'd create an overpowering aroma. An expensive feminine scent that was unusual for the dock might draw men to the storeroom's door. If she could push the Anna and Pisacorns through, through the ventilation holes, they might catch someone's eye. Praveen opened the vial and spilled it along the open edges of the door. Then she pushed an Anna through, hearing it clink as it hit cobblestones outside. Take the money, she bellowed, feeling like a huckster at the circus. Money, 
money, money. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Sujata, and thanks again to everyone for coming out. I was purposefully not making eye contact with our uh, very helpful timer because I know we're a couple minutes over. So thank you so much. Thanks to the Library of Congress, Colleen Shogan again, and Nick Brown. If you enjoyed this event, but you really want to hear more swearing, our next Noir at the Bar returns October 7th to the Wonderland Ballroom. Hope to see you there, and thanks again. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.